Over many years of studying psychology and biology, over time, I actually started questioning some of the modern preconceptions about mitochondria. The tiny organelles inside everyone's cells that are very often referred to as the powerhouse of the cell, or essentially the source of most energy inside our body, responsible for driving all of the functions inside. But the reason mitochondria became so intriguing to me is maybe because of my earlier experience with video games. And there was this one video game that kind of blew my mind. It's actually based on a novel and a movie from Japan, and it was called Parasite Eve. And I guess without spoiling the plot too much, in essence it evolved mitochondria. But mitochondria that become self-aware and that eventually start to communicate with each other in order to create a perfect life form. But it also involves a lot of murder and a lot of violence, which basically made this an amazing video game. And so even today I actually think this is one of the best games ever made, but the point here is that the story is absolutely mind-blowing. And mind-blowing for the reasons we're going to be discussing in this video, because it turns out that it's actually not that far off. A lot of things mentioned in a novel, and of course the video game, turns out to be at least partially accurate, but only discovered in the last few years. And so hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's discuss some of the more recent discoveries about mitochondria, but because there are so many, this is just going to be part 1. Or I guess technically part 2, because there was a video previously you can check out in the description. And to begin, I guess let's start with a bit of a misconception, in regards to who we think we are. Even though we think of ourselves as human beings, made up of trillions of cells, even on the biological level, we cannot ignore the influence of microbes. Because as of today, over 2200 species of microbes have already been discovered inside of us, with all of them being somewhat crucial and contributing to our survival. And so by sheer numbers, there are actually more microbes inside of us than our physical cells. This is of course the idea behind endosymbiosis. We kind of help each other. We provide home, they provide a lot of other stuff. But if we go back in time, and here we're talking about maybe 2 billion years, one of the first microbes, and I guess one of the most successful microbes to become endosymbiotic inside our cells, was eventually turned into this. Today it's actually believed that they were probably invading bacteria, or might have been actually consumed through the process of phagocytosis, but eventually the two cells became symbiotic with the bacteria in this case producing all of the energy, and the archaea, referred to as Asgard, becoming its home. And you can learn more about this, including the discovery of archaea that most likely turned into our cells over time, in the video in the description. But essentially this was a start of a symbiotic relationship. And a relationship that would last for billions of years, reaching ridiculous levels of complexity. But much more importantly, these bacteria would still maintain a little bit of independence and even possess certain control inside of this new home. In other words, these bacteria always had a lot of impact on the cell they resided in, way beyond just producing energy. And while in just the last decade, a tremendous amount of discoveries about mitochondria suggest that they actually possess way, way more control than we ever thought implying that they have impact on our physical health and even mental health. And that's because even after billions of years, these are still technically just bacteria. They're more primitive than other bacteria, but they still maintain their own DNA, and as we've discovered recently, they can also communicate with each other. In other words, it was discovered that these are actually social organelles. They can literally communicate and even communicate across different tissues. This was actually a discovery from just three years ago, but Martin Picard and Carmen Sandy wrote this article you can find in the description that basically goes through a lot of ways mitochondria seem to communicate with each other while also communicating with other organelles, including the cell's nucleus. And so here they're actually able to synchronize their behavior, exhibit group behavior or various types of interdependence, and are also able to send messages to each other, influencing the whole organism and influencing our survival and of course our lifespan. They're able to create certain types of hormones with those hormones affecting other cells. This was actually discovered in a study by Anusha Angajala and her team back in 2018. But here's I guess the rough map of what all of this looks like and how this ends up driving the immune response as well as influencing cells really far away. But these signals also seem to have effect on other cells and even cell development as in they actually communicate with other body parts, sort of guiding what those cells eventually become. And so in the last five years or so, 
Lots and lots of studies discovered a tremendous amount of effects mitochondria seem to have, influencing learning, memory, cognition, and pretty much every mental and neurological affliction, and even various psychological states, to some extent. And though it might not really make sense at first, it all makes sense when you put this into perspective. Mitochondria, by design, produce all of the energy inside the body by using oxygen. Specifically by using glucose, eventually turning this into what's known as ATP, the energy source for the entire body. And this process is ridiculously effective, much more effective than anything else like fermentation, but it's also extremely demanding, requiring a lot of oxygen. And while well, if you ask yourself what needs oxygen, it's of course mitochondria. But how do you deliver oxygen? Well, our body over billions of years developed two ways, hearts and lungs. And so one argument that could be made here is of course that mitochondria over billions of years basically communicated with each other to build an infrastructure for their own survival. The circulation system and organs like the heart and of course lungs all basically evolved in response to their demands. Or in other words, we're kind of built to serve these little bacteria. Which highlights that this analogy of them being a powerhouse is definitely not correct. They seem to have way more influence than that and potentially represent something much more important. For example, we know that they can also technically destroy their own cell. In other words, they actually have signals that trigger cell death when needed in order to save other cells. They're also responsible for producing certain hormones required for reproduction. They can actually create steroids, and those steroids are necessary for sexual development. But much more importantly, they're able to turn on and turn off the functioning inside nucleus. And because nucleus technically produces everything inside the cell, in some sense, it's actually these guys driving it. So they're sort of like little pilots inside our cells, guiding and driving everything for what seems to be just over 2 billion years now. Although most scientists refer to them as information processors. So they're sort of like the CPU of the cell. And even more intriguingly, they also seem to possess a tremendous amount of sensors. Or basically they have a lot of different receptors on the surface that to some extent keeps them aware of what's going on. And so when they sense something is going wrong, they can actually activate nucleus or even kill the cell. And most of this was actually discovered because sometimes some people are unfortunate enough to have some kind of a mitochondrial disease. And so when they have some kind of a disorder of mitochondria, we can pretty much right away see the effects this produces. And turns out that this isn't just a physical response, this also affects cognition and causes a lot of psychiatric disorders. But because there is so much diversity even in mitochondria inside our cells, even now it's a bit difficult to predict or to even understand how all of this works. But here's actually one study by Picard and his team that definitively confirmed that mood affects mitochondria. In other words, emotional response on Tuesday night was directly measurable in various mitochondria of the immune system the day after, suggesting that there is a direct connection between our emotions and mitochondria. But in one of the most recent studies, researchers actually wanted to discover something else. They wanted to find out why is it that we actually get mitochondria only from our mothers. Our paternal mitochondria, or I guess mitochondria from our fathers, basically disappears. And that's not just us. This affects all animals, with all of us getting our mitochondria from moms only. And so yeah, your mom's mitochondria technically live inside of you. And that's basically what was studied in this study by Zhang and his team in order to understand why this is happening and what this means for our bodies. But to study this, they had to use worms. Here we're talking about C. elegans, or the most commonly used worms in biological studies. And while well, prior to this, we actually already knew that our sperm, despite containing 100 mitochondria inside of it, does not seem to contain any mitochondrial DNA. In other words, sperm, which is of course coming from our dads, only contains the energy cell, but not the way to recreate more. And the assumption was that this was maybe because the sperm cell has to fight so hard to try to get into the egg that it basically uses up all of its energy and the mitochondria in this case are going to become exhausted or even damaged. And so it's actually believed that the father's mitochondrial genome is not passed on simply because mitochondria are just no longer in the top shape. And instead only the mitochondria from mothers are inherited. But to do this they had to find a way to disable the mechanism known as PME, 
paternal mitochondria elimination. And that's the mechanism that destroys the mitochondrial DNA inside sperm, making sure that it's not passed on. But turns out that it's very difficult to do. This mechanism is so important that it's practically impossible to disable it. In other words, the evolution made sure that paternal DNA coming from mitochondria is not passed on. But they were able to delay it by at least a few hours. And so when this mechanism was delayed, the worms that were fertilized were impaired in a lot of different ways. They had a lot less energy, they had difficulty reproducing, they also had impaired cognition, and overall had a lot less ATP or energy of the cell compared to their normal peers. Although surprisingly, a lot of this was actually reversed when scientists introduced vitamin K2. This is usually a bone health supplement, but in this case it actually restored ATP levels, suggesting that there is maybe a way to treat this even in humans. And that's because in some cases, turns out that paternal mitochondrial DNA can sometimes be passed on. But as of today, there are only very few documented cases. In one example though, a 28-year-old man had a lot of problems with muscles, had problem breathing, and could not do any exercise at all, which actually turned out to be the result of paternal mitochondria. But in total, only 17 cases are known to us, with all of the cases producing a lot of physical and mental disorders. Although based on this study, at least now we know that there is a vitamin that can potentially reverse some of this. But this paper was finally able to explain why only our mom's mitochondria ends up inside of us. With the conclusion being that it's really to maintain their health. Because mom's mitochondria is much healthier, it's the best possible solution in order to have a healthier organism. But not everything here is perfect. And sometimes mitochondrial DNA and specifically the leftovers or the scraps, can actually sometimes enter our own DNA, merging into our genome and becoming what's known as new mites. This animation here kind of shows us how this usually happens, but in essence, when this new mite becomes integrated into human genome, which seems to happen every 4,000 births, it can occasionally cause issues. Because it actually acts like a typical viral DNA and can technically cut our genome or become what's known as a jumping gene. And so the new mite accumulation can actually end up contributing to aging or even functional decline and can be detrimental. And so the recent study you can find in a description discovered that new mites appeared every 12.6 days, but the rate of their production increased dramatically in much more stressful situations. And so this is possibly one way how stress can affect our cells and why you can actually age very quickly in very stressful conditions. And though this was only discovered in neurons so far, this is believed to happen in every cell in our body. And so individuals that have higher new mites inside neurons seem to actually live much less. Which is a pretty important discovery when it comes to longevity. Now we obviously have no idea how to decrease new mite production, but this is at least one way mitochondria tends to affect our cells negatively. But I guess that's the price you pay for having such an unusual organelle inside the cell. And so all of these new discoveries basically suggest that these bizarre organelles are way more influential than we ever thought. But they also suggest that there is a way to help us by helping them. For example, the conclusion from every study here is that things like exercise, spending time in the sun, and good nutrition seems to produce healthier mitochondria, which make us healthier as a result. So basically here, we're helping ourselves by, I guess, helping them. Although here, the bigger question is, what exactly is this us? So who are we anyway? Because as I mentioned previously, when you actually look at the evolution of all of the organs in our body, it really looks like they were basically created to help mitochondria get better. But at least for now, I wanted to stop here. We're going to come back and talk more about additional discoveries in some of the future videos, because obviously there were so many more. Until then, check out previous videos in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this show on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.